There are a few books that really have shaped my life and have shaped my ministry. Our guest today, Philip Yancey, wrote one from about 25 years ago. It was called, What's So Amazing About Grace? We have an implicit thirst for grace and we're judged constantly by what kind of house we live in, what kind of car we drive, what kind of clothes we're wearing. Underneath, that's a, that's a dead end street. Jesus comes along, kind of turns everything upside down. I read it, loved it. It was transformative to me, Philip, in many ways. Mm -hmm. When I saw that you had a 25 year update, instantly <laughs> I thought I would love to have him back because I have so many questions for you. So thanks for writing the book. Thanks for doing an update. And we appreciate you joining us today. Well, great. I'm surprised you were reading 25 years ago, Sean. <laughs> well, I might be a little bit older than you think, but okay, I'll take that okay. as a compliment. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Right. So I want to let's go back 25 years before we get to this update. Mm, what was yeah. the original motivation or inspiration for writing What's So Amazing About Grace? The, the Christian world, especially the evangelical world, was just getting into politics at that time. Mm. The moral majority was a big name um, and political characters were being judged by uh, not not just their theology, but their political stances. And it, it was a different situation back then, John, as you remember, when Jimmy Carter was elected, I think it was Newsweek magazine did a whole cover story on the year of the evangelical. So evangelicals were actually at their peak in terms of percentage of Americans, just mm. about 30%. So a major political block as New York saw it. And uh, for the first time, people like Falwell, Robertson, others, Francis Schaeffer was part of that movement we're getting evangelicals involved in politics. When I grew up, it was, a, it was a fundamentalist type church in the South, as you know, and we didn't really dabble in politics at all. The only time it came up was when John Kennedy, a Catholic ran for president, and then we mm -hmm. started talking about that. But uh, we were into legalism, you know, we were into behavior things, not really into even the issues like abortion, the, the homosexual and gender issues hadn't even come up yet. So suddenly those became in the forefront and a phrase like culture wars came mm -hmm. into existence for the first time. And it, it seemed to be a time when we were cracking apart, we were building walls between mm -hmm. each other. And of course, since then it's only magnified. Now the divide is great compared to what it was 25 years ago. You know, it's interesting to ask my dad when he first wrote evidence that demands a verdict, no publisher wanted it. Nobody <laughs> thought it was going to sell ironically enough. And so looking mm -hmm. back, there's obviously a deep surprise at how well that book is done. Well, yeah. you express a similar surprise 25 years later going, I yeah. have no idea this book has sold 2 million copies plus. That's incredible. Why do you think this book has done so well and deserves a revision and an update? Brother, I would have to say we have an implicit thirst for grace. Mm. It's, a, it's a society of ungrace. We, humans are like that. We're a ranking people. So uh, in the United States, especially, you, you know, you pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. We like being independent. We like to, to carve our way. And we're judged constantly by what kind of house we live in, what kind of car we drive, what kind of clothes we're wearing. You know, that, that's how we judge people. Well, what school did you go to? And we're making all these little judgments. And, and the higher you climb the social ladder, the more intense that begins to be. But underneath, underneath that's a that's a dead end street it doesn't really satisfy and you live in constant pressure about it and jesus comes along kind of turns everything upside down where he goes to the lower part of the social ladder and says mm -hmm. these are my people and including the lower part of the moral ladder you know he was criticized in this day for hanging around sinners and prostitutes and tax collectors and people like that and it's it's a different world now because we we're kind of divided into good people, like the church people, and then those bad people over there. Well, uh, Jesus has two different categories. Uh, mm. There are two categories, but the categories are people who are ready to receive my grace and people who aren't. And I find that really, if you peel back the layers of competition and all this stuff we live under, there is a thirst for grace. There's a thirst for acceptance and love, not, mm. not based on your performance, because we're all going to fail that way, but rather based on the the foundational love of God. That's what the universe is all about. 
in many ways, it seems like your book just kind of scratched where an itch was, culturally mm. speaking, and within the church. Uh, yeah. I would kind of describe it as kind of a, a breath of fresh air, so to speak. I'm an apologist, so I want to argue for truth, and Christianity is true. But there's something about grace that just grabs the heart, and we mm. have to have both of them. And I get that feeling and that sense and that encouragement when I read your book. I love Vanishing Grace as well. And writers, you quote people like Henry Nowen. Mm -hmm. Would you argue that we need grace more now than when you wrote this 25 years ago? Uh, if so, why? And maybe what? coupling with that response, what has changed in culture and or the church over that 25 years? I, I really would. You hear statements like, uh, America has never been more divided. And I kind of sit back and laugh a little bit. You know, we did have a civil war. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I lived through the 1960s when there were a thousand bombings a year, domestic bombings, mm. so people forget that. And there were hundreds of thousands of people marching in the street every, almost every day against the war and against Richard Nixon and all that. So we, we have been through divisions before, but this one is, seems to be becoming much more a secular religious divide. Mm. We've all seen the charts of the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, you know, who, people who have no religious commitment, it keeps growing and growing so that now the youngest group of people are right about half and half. Some, so about half have some religious commitment, about half have none. That's why they check that box. And, and there is a division on, on certain issues. I mentioned the gender issues, they're big all the time. Race issues are still important and, and they are important. And uh, globally, we're in a much more fractious state now than 25 mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, Communism had fallen. These countries were throwing off the shackles that they'd lived under for 70 years or so. And they were looking to the West for some answers, for some solutions. And uh, you may remember Francis Fukuyama came along and said, it's the end of history. You know, mm -hmm. liberal democracy has won. Well, flash forward 25 years and you've got the Cold War, you know, just right back almost where it was with uh, Putin threatening nuclear uh, use of nuclear weapons and involved in a, a terrible war in Ukraine and China and, and the United States once again being rivals. So it, it's a more perilous time that we live in now than 25 years ago. 25 years ago, I went back and looked at the newspapers. What was the number one news in, in the papers every day? Bill Clinton and a White House intern. Mm. <laughs> and that was it. You know, yep. it, it's, it's a lot dirtier and a lot meaner now. Mm. Fair enough. Well, maybe we should pause. We maybe should have done this at the beginning, but you've written a book called What's So Amazing About Grace. Mm. Define grace for us. What is it? Maybe give an example. And the one that jumped out to me, I'd never thought about it like this. You said for some people, romantic love is the closest they get to experiencing grace. So define it, maybe explain what you mean by that. Sure. Yeah, I, I always hesitate to define grace. Jesus certainly never did that. Mm. Anybody asked him about it, he would just tell a story. Mm. So I do a lot of that in the book. In fact, I take some of Jesus' stories, the parables, and, and put them into the 21st century now. And, you know, tell the story of the prodigal son about a girl from Detroit who, who gets involved with uh, prostitution, sex slavery, which would be a very contemporary example of what Jesus was talking about. And, um, but we have these clues all over, don't we? I, I mentioned, I have a list somewhere of about 30 words where they take something of the root word of grace and okay. apply it in different ways, like grace notes in music. You know, you can do without them, but boy, you put them in there and it's just a lot better. Or giving a gratuity uh, or a grace period. Uh, I rented a car one time and came back an hour late and I thought they were going to charge me on a whole extra day. And they said, no, no, we have a grace period. And I kind of stopped mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said to the, uh, to the woman at the Hertz counter, I said, Grace, what, did, what is that? And she said, well, I don't know. I guess it means that even though you were supposed to pay, you don't have to. That's not bad. That's a good start. <laughs> sure. Know? And, and there is something theological about grace that, you don't earn, there's nothing you can do to earn God's love. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more. God already loves us infinitely as much as a God can possibly love his creatures. And 
that's a welcome message. I think that's that's the root of the thirst. We want to be loved. Romantic love was a stepping stone for me in getting to that place. Finally, a, a person came along who didn't just pick out everything that was wrong with me, but everything that was right with me. And you know, what a great feeling that is. And we, we have these little hints dropped into culture and dropped into our emotions. And, and we kind of wish, I wish it were true. It's so good, as, as Tolkien once said, it, it's so good, it has to be true. <laughs> you know? mm. And, and when, when you taste of the little bit of grace that we have in our own competitive society, you think, what if the whole universe was like that? What if it's really true? What if God truly does love us in the way the Bible says? And it can, mm. it can transform people. It's interesting that grace has the same root as gratuity because you go to a restaurant in the States and people expect a gratuity. Yeah, right. It's not really yeah. grace. But yeah. I was traveling with my wife and we were, we were speaking in New Zealand and they told us, they're like, it's not expected. If you leave it, it really is a, an unexpected blessing and a gift for that person. They don't expect it. So New Zealand, it's more like grace, not in the US, it's expected, yeah. interestingly yeah. enough. So yeah, you, isn't that funny? Here we've we've taken that uh, gratuity, and and now receipts will come twenty two percent, twenty five percent, thirty percent. You know, yeah. we're we're ranking grace. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That, that's one of the things you talk about in your book is that we just we have a hard time with grace, yeah. and we just feel this natural instinct to add to it. We resist this free gift. Yeah. What is it about grace that we just can't accept? Is it our nature that God has made us that when we're given, we give back? What is it about grace that in some ways, even though it's free, makes it hard to receive? Well, I think it's it's that grace is unfair. So mm. imagine the the older brother in the story of the prodigal son. I mean, he did everything right. And... Here is his brother comes along, squanders his share of the inheritance, and he comes back. He should be punished. You know, the, the father should turn his back and say, I don't want to have any, uh, anything to do with you. If we're going to have a banquet, we're going to have a banquet for your brother here who actually followed the rules. But no, you know, the prodigal son was the one who was celebrated, and the father was running to meet him and welcome him back. And, and a very economical story or economic story, Jesus told about uh an employer who hired some people at eight o'clock in the morning, nine o'clock in the morning, and they worked all day. And then he hired some people at five o'clock in the afternoon. And at the end of the day, they only worked one hour and they got the same pay as everybody else. And that's not fair. I mean, imagine <laughs> if you were one of those people who worked all day in the sun, the Middle Eastern sun. And, and Jesus gives the moral of the story. He, he says the, the landowner, the employer or God, as, as it would be, said, can't I be generous to whoever I want to be generous mm. to? You know, it's, I'm not ripping anybody off. I'm paying everybody exactly what they deserve. But these people, actually none of you deserve it. <laughs> and grace is like that. And I am so thankful when someone turns to me and just mm. holds out their hands that I will fill that hand with God's love, with God's forgiveness and grace. You really explain this in the chapter in the book called The New Math of Grace. And by the way, mm -hmm. my wife is a math teacher in oh. high school. So I'm always looking for these examples to help her tie something from scripture and philosophy to teach her students just how to think about math. And I was like, I was reading it to her going, hey, this is good stuff you could bring in. But what do you mean by the new math of grace? I was with uh, the rock star Bono one time mm. and I had just read a book that he wrote in typical Bono fashion. He didn't go to his Sunday school teacher to write a biography. He went to a, a French atheist. <laughs> this journalist who knew him well had followed him around. And in in that book, which is several hundred pages long, you can see you I don't remember the author's name, but you can see him trying to figure out, you know, Bono's cool and, and Bono's global and people like Bono and he's this old fashioned Christian stuff, he really takes it seriously. And, and he's trying to understand grace. And he says, you know, explain to me how, to, how this works that, okay, we owe God something, we've done something terrible that we deserve punishment for. And then God sends his son and his son dies and all is forgiven. You know, I, this just doesn't make sense to me. 
And Bono says, well, you're, you're right. It doesn't make a lot of sense. That is what grace is. But the alternative is karma. The alternative is, to, mm. is for everything to be fair. The mm. old math, the old math of religion, mm. to, be, to be judged exactly for what you did. And if you, you know, you go into Hinduism and, and they've been working on that for several thousand years and they say you could, you could have several million incarnations before you pay off punishment for the sins that you, that you committed in the previous ones. And, uh, and Mano at the end says, well, you know, that, that's the choice, karma and grace. And I'm going to put my lot with, with grace. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I feel much more comfortable there. And that's, that is unnatural. I call it an unnatural act to, uh, to forgive to, or to even be forgiven. We want to punish people. We want there to be justice and fairness. And, and grace is not fair, but it's not fair in ways that we should be thankful for, <laughs> grateful for. There's that word again. Because uh, we, we can't make it any other way. The only way to make it is to hold out our hands and say, they're empty, God. Can you fill them? That's what Henry Nouwen used to say. He said, uh, you, you can't do anything to earn grace by definition. You can't deserve it. It's just a matter of having your hands open to receive the gift. But if your hands aren't open, the gift will just fall to the ground and be unreceived. And that was what the Pharisees did in Jesus' day. You know, they're into that ranking thing. I'm better than you are. I'm more, I follow more of the 613 laws than you do. And then that sinner over there, God will never listen to that sinner. And Jesus turns that on its head every time and says, which of those prayers is God going to listen to? The sinner who says, I, I have empty hands. I, I, I just need help, God. Can you help me? Rather than the Pharisee who says, oh, I'm doing pretty well, better than 99% of people in, around me right now. I love that idea of the new math because we were talking about the parable of the 99 sheep. Jesus leaves mm. 99 for the one. That makes no sense. When you right. stand, <laughs> like unless when you're you, the one. <laughs> unless you're the one. That's very true. But kind of this capitalist mindset, we value yeah. numbers rather than individuals and this idea of grace, then we start to see that metric differently. Now, I p- part of my story, I love that you quote now and so much because I grew up in a Christian home. You know, my father uh, for a long time, apologist, but some people might not know as an apologist, just incredibly grace filled and yet still found myself trying to earn my way to God. I remember being in college and I was an RA and I thought, you know what? I'm going to create a board on the wall for people really committed to Jesus. The movies we watch, the music we listen to, because I have this person out of this, like I'm all in. And then it just hit me. I'm like, what am I doing? I'm like burning myself out. This is not the road of Jesus. So there's something inside that for all of us. In many ways, I'm actually looking at the painting, The Return of the Prodigal Son by Rembrandt, which is a book that now and has related more to the older son than the younger son in my journey. And it was grace that really brought that faith home. You had a very different background. Now we've done an interview and covered in depth this before, but you described kind of more of a fundamentalist Christian background. You rejected faith for a while because of a lack of grace, you said, but you also said that grace pulled you along the way and you returned to the faith because you found grace nowhere else. Mm, Tell us about that. Yes. In, in my day, as I mentioned, legalism, that was the standard we use. And everybody, mm-hmm. every denomination tried to be more strict than the other denominations. So the really loose ones would be like the Episcopalians. They drink wine. Mm-hmm. There were Southern Baptists who actually grew tobacco. And so you could see them smoking on the steps outside. And, and, and then you work. And we were down to a kind of a fundamentalist Baptist church. And, and we studied things like... Uh, Bowling is that wrong? Because uh, they serve alcohol in bowling alleys, you know, and 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 roller skating. Well, it looks a lot like dancing, you know. So, and and that's how we were more spiritual. Mm. And I would go to camps, Christian camps, and they'd have the camper of the week, and and I knew how to do that stuff. You know, you just you sit out on the porch real early in the morning with your Bible open and your eyes closed. Maybe you're sleeping, maybe you're praying, but they don't know the difference, you know. And you do that in front of people and. He's, oh, he's, he's very spiritual. So they vote for you and then your camp of the week. And I, I learned that that can be kind of a game. And I, I think that was 
Jesus' complaint against the Pharisees. Pharisees weren't bad people. They were very good people. They were very moral, virtuous people. But, I mean, they went so far as to tithe their kitchen spices, you know, 10% of my salt, my pepper, my oregano, whatever. <laughs> that all goes to God. And, and yet, as Jesus said, you missed the whole point. You know, you don't do it. You don't get God's love by impressing God. That's, you don't have to do that. Grace is free, but you got to hold your hands out. You got to want it. You got to re- be willing to receive it. And, and I think that's really a, a temptation that Christians mm-hmm. fall for and have fallen for all through history. You can go back and read Christian history and there are all these little groups that, that split off of each other over some way in which they're more spiritual or have more doctrine, more correct doctrine than the other group. And the world looks at that and says, man, I don't want anything to do with that. Jesus said, I, I want you to be one. I want you to be unified, known for unity. And the church is not known for unity. It's known for disunity. Last I heard, there were 45,000 denominations. And that's what people see. They say, well, I, where do you start? Who, who, these people can't even agree among themselves. Why should I believe what they believe? And and we uh, we just we just miss it. We, as Jesus says, you know, we we look at everybody else with critical eyes when actually we got this big log in our own eyes, keeping our vision from from seeing what God has offered freely to us. I love it. Now, you had a line in your book that jumped out to me and I thought, I wish you would explain this more. And maybe you just dropped it so we would think about it. And it's the idea that you're at Bible college, things were very legalistic, wrestling mm-hmm. with your faith. And you described first experiencing grace through music. Mm-hmm. What do you mean by grace through music? When I emerged from that fundamentalist type church, the image of God I had was of this cosmic super cop, just looking for somebody who might be enjoying themselves so he could squash them. And I, I really believed the heart of the universe was a frown, not a smile. And I, I wrote this uh, book we talked about last time I was on the program called Where the Light Fell. And that came from uh, a quote by St. Augustine, mm-hmm. who said, I couldn't look at the sun directly because it would scorch me, but I could look at where the light fell and gradually over time i follow those those beams of light those rays back to the to the source to god himself and that was my experience i had lived through a pretty tough childhood i had my, my guard up uh trying to keep them keep from being hurt i suppose keep the world sure. from hurting me and then i had this image of god uh dangling us over over hellfire and uh, you know, if we make one, if we do one thing wrong, he's going to let go, and there we go, burning forever. And we would hear these sermons over and over again. And I identify three things in that book that that really changed my perception of God. One was uh, the beauties of nature. Nature was my place of refuge. I would go out into the woods and collect insects and butterflies and birds and you know that kind of stuff. And it was just a peaceful place that spoke to me. One was romantic love, mm. uh, and I've mentioned that, and one was music. So those three things, nature, music, romantic love. What they did, Sean, is they convinced me, my idea, my image of God is completely off base. Wow. A God who c- could create the monarch butterfly, a, a God who could create these birds, a God a God who claims to love us and, and this romantic love that I feel is something new. And I have just a glimmer of what a God could provide. I, I've mis, I've misjudged God. I've got the wrong wow. idea. And there was a, a line G.K. Chesterton uses it. I don't think he actually invented it, but he said this. He said, the worst moment for an atheist is when he has a profound sense of gratitude and has mm-hmm. no one to thank. And that's the, condition I found myself in. I was deeply grateful for these good things, the good things of earth, the father of all good gifts, the Bible calls God. I was grateful for them, but I, I didn't, I wanted to get to, the, to know the artist. You see a great work of art and you want to know something about where that came from, what that artist is like, what his hobbies are, what he reads, what he likes himself. And and that's, that was a turning point for me because I realized I had just 
grown up with the wrong image of God. You know, it's amazing. These are what some theologians would call common grace. So Correct. obviously not a, a sermon or a passage in scripture or a vision of God coming down and a supernatural intervention, but a flower, a sunset, mm. music, something yeah. beautiful that tells us there's something more transcendent than the world in which we see. And it's just incredible to me in a fundamentalist background, God used something outside of the church, ironically, <laughs> to get your attention to what his true character was really like. That's just, that, that's a powerful thing. Now, when I when I first read your book, was it 1998 that it first came out? Is that right? It was late 90s, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so I was a senior in college. Two big things stood out to me. Uh, first off was the story about the girl who runs away and goes to Traverse City. Yeah. I read that last year at my son's high school graduation after teaching on the prodigal oh. son. And Philip, oh. I, just, I just fell into tears. I just cried oh. through it. Mm -hmm. I love that story. And second, how you would go ask people, when I say the words evangelical Christian, what comes to mind? And that was one of the first time for me I thought, this is interesting. People are going to judge God through us. How yeah. do outsiders view us? So mm. has that changed in the 25 years? And how do you think we got the rap that we got? So in other words, maybe also include that when you ask people the question, what words come to mind when you think of evangelical Christian? What do they say and what do you think they continue to say today? Yes. There's a statement by, I think it was Dorothy Sayers, who said that God has undergone three great humiliations. The first one was the incarnation, choosing to become a, a person, you know, this a God of a trillion galaxies, shrinking down to become a tiny little fetus, <laughs> you know, who's born on earth and, and lives here. Second great humiliation was the cross subjecting God's own self to that brutal and humiliating way of killing another person. And then the third one she said is the church. And when wow. I, and she said, maybe that is oh. the hardest of all to trust God's reputation and trust that in the likes of us. And we don't do a very good job, but that mm -hmm. was God's plan all along. You know, God had a body, the body of Jesus here on earth. And you could, shake hands with him, you could ask him questions, you could argue with him, you could crucify him. But then Jesus left and he said, I've done my work, now it's up to you, and turned over the mission to his disciples. And he said, go into all the world, and, and we're all part of that fulfillment. And, and Paul calls that, that's the body of Christ, that is God's presence in the world. If people are gonna know what God is like, the primary way now is through you, by looking at you and studying your lives. Boy, that's a, that's a scary thought, isn't it? And and when I would start asking people, say, in an air, airport lounge or something, I would say, I'm doing a survey, I'm a writer, I'm writing a book. And uh, you probably heard of evangelical Christian. Oh, yeah. So when I said that word, what was the first thing that came to your mind? What phrase? And they would say, well, let's see. Uh, holier than thou. Wow. Oh, okay. Uh, hypocrite. Or they might mention some prominent evangelicals who had fallen fallen from grace in, in uh, the news lately. And I started thinking, holier than thou, what a, what a damning indictment. Because as Jesus said, <laughs> the only measure that counts is, is God's holiness. He said, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, nobody can do that. That's Jesus' point. Yeah, that's why you need grace. You know? mm. But, but instead we're, we're climbing this little ladder here and it's easy for us because we don't do some of those things that are self-destructive. We, we aren't prostitutes, we don't do drugs, whatever. So it's easy to say, well, at least we're not that bad. <laughs> and, and, and we're holier than thou, but that's not the standard. It's we're less holy than thou. You know? And that's what we ought to just keep in mind all the time. Uh, we're not, we're not it, it's not a competition on, on who is good. You know, if you probe those people I'm talking to in the airport lounge, if you say, well, how do you get God to love you? Well, you'd be good. But they would say that, you know, you, you don't break the Ten Commandments, you know, do stuff like that. Well, I, I'm in favor of the Ten Commandments and, and they're given for a good reason. We work best that way. We live best that way. Hmm. That's not how, that's not how you get God to love you. <laughs> the way to get God to love, God already loves you. The way to, Receive it is just to hold out your hands and realize that that's the source. God is the source, not me. 
and there's none, none of this little climbing up that ladder I can do to get somewhere. It's not going to get me anywhere because I'm not as holy as thou. The only way I can do that is through Jesus, God's son, and who wants to include us in the body of Christ, his, his body, his presence in the whole world right now. So I played basketball at Biola University in 94 to 98. And my coach, phenomenal coach, one of the winningest coaches in the history of college basketball, just incredible. And he also has a doctorate and four masters and a personal library at home. He's literally brilliant. And hmm. he would quote people to us. I remember he gave us a quote one time after practice. He said something like, the greatest theologian of the 20th century, Karl Barth, was asked, you know, something to the effect of what's the greatest thing or most important message about Christianity? And he says, Jesus loves me. This I know. <laughs> and that really stu stuck with me, stood with uh -huh. me going back 20 some years. Will you also cite Karl Barth on many occasions, but also that specific quote? Yes. Yet it's also come out, as you know, that Karl Barth had some pretty deeply immoral practices in his life, including an ongoing adulterous affair with his assistant, Charlotte, which mm -hmm. put incredible strain on, on Bart's wife. In fact, as far as I understand, he even had Charlotte come live in their home despite yeah, his wife's threats. So we look at someone like Karl Bart, brilliant theologian. How do we balance this contribution with the immorality that he clearly lived, especially the scriptural standard that woe to those who teach, do we just give him grace? Like, how do we balance that in your mind? Well, let me peel that apart a little bit. Uh, I would separate the, the man and his behavior from the, the truth or value in what he said and wrote. Um, I think I think that those are separate issues. I mean, Karl Barth can only be judged by one person in his behavior, and, that, and that's God. Mm -hmm. And you know, God promises to do that, and I I only trust God with that. I don't trust anybody mm -hmm. else. I wouldn't trust anybody else judging me on on that. So uh, I'm sure. Well, I, I don't know this for sure. Maybe you know more. I, I don't know if people around him knew about it at the time and tried to confront him about it in a, mm. in a biblical way. You know, Jesus and Paul both set out ways to do that. And I don't know if anybody tried that or if it's some secret that came out later after his death. But I, I do think it's important that his behavior doesn't make untrue the things, the good things that he said. Um, an example of that, and this is not quite the same because I'm talking about a person in the Bible, Think of think of Solomon. I mean, we read the book of Proverbs, and there's there's great truth in there, and Solomon is credited with a lot of those proverbs, and yet he spent his life breaking those proverbs. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and uh, he had what eight hundred concubines or something like that. Something. And uh, yeah, and and yet it doesn't invalidate the wisdom in those proverbs, and. Uh, Barth's behavior by our standard should have disqualified him from positions of spiritual responsibility mm. if people knew about it and, and it was investigated and all. Evidently, that did not happen. Uh, it's, it's a shame. Karl Barth is in the arms of God, and I, I trust that. It's not my job to judge him, but I, I, wouldn't, let, I wouldn't let that, even if it were completely true, the rumors we've heard, I wouldn't let that invalidate much of the truth of what he said. Hmm. In fact, you know, I, I've known people like, I'll, I'll use a contemporary example. Brennan Manning is a person yeah. who yeah. has affected a lot of people. Mm -hmm. He wrote a book called All Is Grace. And in there, he confessed that he had done some terrible things. You know, he, he had made up some stuff and was telling it as, as if it were true. And then he had a constant drinking problem and, and he just kind of threw himself in the, in the arms of grace. And you look at it and it was, it's sad. You wonder what could have been if he was able to really deal with these issues. He, he wasn't. But he's he's had a powerful impact on a lot of people, especially people who are addicts and just keep falling and falling and falling because Brennan never never let go. You know, he kept holding onto that rope even as he was falling. And, and so God can use 
all kinds of people. I often think, who are the greatest people in the Bible? The real heroes. And you know, it's Moses, who had an anger problem and committed murder, and David, who had murder and adultery, and, and Peter, who denied Jesus three times, much like Judas, and, and the Apostle Paul, who started out by torturing Christians. And this is the best of the crop. These are the giants of faith. You know? And, and I, think, I think God deliberately orchestrated that so that nobody could say, well, I could never... God could never use me after what I've done. And look at these guys. These are the giants. And God can redeem those things. And uh, I would imagine that Karl Barth had many kind of wrestling prayers with God uh, over his plight. And uh, and as, as Brennan said, every time I fell, that drove me back to God's grace. Not everybody goes that direction. Often people go the other direction. I don't want to, that through guilt or shame or whatever, I don't want to have anything to do with God. But Brennan at least let it push him back toward grace. And I, I hope that uh, Karl Barth did the same thing. Hmm. There's a story in, there's a lot of stories in your book. They're going to ruffle some feathers on all sides of this hmm. debate. And I can't imagine the letters you've received from folks. You even talk about some of them. But one of the stories that you share, I had heard this before was about Jeffrey Dahmer, the late right. serial killer. Now, if you were to ask people who are some of the most evil people you can think of, yeah. probably you'd have Hitler and Jeffrey Dahmer because of a serial right. killer doing certain things I'm not even gonna describe here, would probably be towards the top of the list. Yep. Tell us a little bit of the story that you include and why you include it and what you just wanted readers to take away or at least wrestle with in light of his story? Yes, that came out of a small group I was involved in, and the news was just happening live as, as we were meeting. Uh, Jeffrey Dahmer had been, Dahmer had been brutally murdered by uh, other cellmates in, in, in prison. There are different accounts of how he was mur murdered, but they interviewed his chaplain, and he said, Jeffrey became a Christian. He was my most loyal and diligent student. And for many months, he would just pour over the Bible. And it, I would have to say it was, it was real. It was legitimate. And after that, I actually heard from, see if you know this name, Sean, uh, Mark Chapman. Does that ring any bells? It He's doesn't. the person who he shot John Lennon. Oh, okay. Uh, big in so the you're news. dating me a little bit. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, you've heard of John Lennon, I presume. Yes, of course. <laughs> And he still uh, is in prison in New York. His wife has stayed with him all this time. And he, he uses his time to, to spread the gospel. He's a, he was mentally ill and he's very remorseful and has really turned his life around and publishes his story and, and gives it out. His, his wife stayed with him. She lives in Hawaii, but sees him regularly. And we uh, became kind of pen pals. And... That happens with prisoners, and I. Uh, what can you say? I mean, we could say, God has some strange taste. <laughs> you know? God, God likes. I one time I, I put it this way that um, redeemed pain impresses me more than pain removed, and I would mm. say redeemed sin impresses me more than sin removed. You know, you, when you get to know somebody like that, like a Jeffrey Dahmer uh, or, well, there's a scene in The Hiding Place of this Nazi guard who, who asked forgiveness from Corey Ten Boom and how hard that was for her to grant it. And, but he had received forgiveness from God. And, and we think, well, that's not fair. They don't deserve it. Well, you're right. It's not fair. Grace is not fair. That's what's so hard about it. But it's a powerful thing. And if you are one of those evil people, it's it's really your only way out. It's your only chance to, to have a higher power than, than you can imagine, turn your life around and turn you into the kind of person that God had in mind in the first place. It just raises so many questions well, in yeah. the sense of like, I was watching a show on Ted Bundy recently mm -hmm. and one of the uh, one of the detectives or no journalists who interviewed him said he just struck me as so normal and yeah. this was on amazon prime and he said it started to hit me that bundy's human and i'm human 
what's in his heart is in my heart. Mm. Am I capable of that? And then the show cut that off. I thought, holy cow. Mm -hmm. Well, from a Christian perspective, that's true for Dahmer. And yeah. so the scandal of graces, if you're a Christian and you resist and think he's gone too far, he cannot be forgiven. Maybe we don't understand the beauty of God's grace and the power of God's transformation. On a flip side, if you're not a Christian and you think this makes no sense, he's gone too far, he can't be forgiven. Well, maybe you also don't understand the character of God and the price that Jesus paid. Either way, yeah. that story shakes all of us up and makes us ask deep questions about grace. So mm -hmm. I love that you included in there. Now, another thing you say that I think is going to stir up some folks is you say, I, I think it's a direct quote, you said, I grew up as a racist mm -hmm. and you just own it. And I really appreciate your honesty here because today sometimes people say if you're a sexual pedophile or racist, those are like the two unforgivable sins. Right. And yeah. in a book on grace, you just own your heritage and give some examples of things that I know you look back on and are like, man, I wish I could shake my younger self. But what led to your transformation where you look back on that now and see it completely differently? And what mm. role do you think grace can play in race relations today. Yeah. You know, while you were talking about Jeffrey Dahmer and uh, some of the others, I was thinking back to, I, I spent time reading some of the pages of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa that mm -hmm. Archbishop uh, Desmond Tutu uh, kind of convened. And the rules there were, you had to be, you had to be brutally honest about what you had done. And the, the apartheid policy, as bad as it was, was actually invented by the church, the Dutch Reformed Church in South Africa. And so one by one, these these nice white, uh, outstanding citizen, uh, church every Sunday soldiers would come in to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and confess these terrible things they had done, killing people, putting tires around their neck and, and lighting them, you know, and just terrible things. And, and there were some black South Africans who, who also appear being accused of, of great crimes like that. And, and Tutu would conduct these hearings and sometimes just have to call a break because he couldn't tolerate the horror of what he was hearing. And when I was growing up, uh, South Africa was, they, they were the good guys and it was the, it was the black Africans who were the bad guys in the church, in my church, I lived in Atlanta. Martin Luther King was, was, a an imposter. He was a troublemaker. Even though he grew up in Atlanta, he was considered a carpetbagger. He just came down here to make trouble for us. And my pastor would actually call him the name Martin Lucifer Kuhn. And it was, it was that bad. And, you know, your kid, you, you kind of absorb the, the prejudice as well of uh, people around you. The turning point for me, frankly, was, was just a realization that it, the church had lied to me. Because we were taught the curse of ham theory, that people of color were meant to be a servant race and they could never rise above a certain level. It's, you can hardly believe that. But this is in my lifetime, 50 years ago, they were still teaching it. And I got a fellowship at the Center for Disease Control, which was called Communicable Disease Center back then. And uh, I knew that my, my supervisor was a PhD in biochemistry, renowned, had a lot of papers published, had patents, and I, he went to Yale. And I went in, and he's a black man, and I almost dropped my, my books, my papers, because I was taught you could never reach that kind of level of expertise as a person of color. Wow. And then I realized the church lied to me. They wow. betrayed me. Mm -hmm. So if they lied about that, maybe they lied about Jesus, about the Bible. And that became that began the period of kind of questioning yeah. that I had to go through, and had been didn't know the word back at the time, but deconstructing and reconstructing faith. I, I went through that period without knowing what it was, and oh, how do you overcome it? Well, repentance is a huge factor. You know, we're not you, you use that word unforgivable. We're, we're living in more and more of a cancel culture where if you if somebody listened to me saying telling that story. To you, they could say, well, we could never have him at, speaking at our school because look sure. at it. He was a sinner. Well, you're right. I was a sinner. Mm. I was a sinner. But unless you believe in forgiveness, unless you believe in 
and, and a God. How do you get rid of that? How do you get forgiveness? And our culture is struggling with that mightily. So there's this whole cancel line where you can't appear on campus if you represent this point of view, because that's not in some cases politically correct, in some cases morally correct. But there's just no way to climb back if, if you have done something wrong on either side, either the conservative side or the liberal side. And grace is really the only hope for bringing those two sides together. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do, and I, I would hope that the Christian church would be that place, that third place that shows, well, as, as Paul said, I mean, Paul was, was a Pharisee and, and he, every day he would pray this prayer. He would pray, thank you, Lord, that I wasn't born a, a woman and that I wasn't born a slave and that I wasn't born um, a, a Gentile. And, and then later after he's been converted, he says, in Christ, there is no male nor female slave nor free, Jew nor Gentile. Well, what a dramatic change. And in the early church, that's how it stood out because you've got slaves, former slaves, current slaves. And then you've got rich people over here. you got women and men all together, which was unusual back then. And, and you've got Jews and Gentiles, and they're all worshiping together. And the church showed society a whole different way to be. Instead, now we tend to be kind of more tribal, you know, we hang around our own kind on, on all sides and, and we don't really mix. We don't really get to know the other people in, 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 a, in a way that where we could have an impact on them and they on us. Philip, I'm curious how grace has changed you since you first wrote this book. Now, let me set it up this way. When I read it in 1998, I was, how old was I? I don't know, 23 years old, 22 maybe probably a senior in college, maybe right out of college. And it made a lot of sense to me. It was influential to me. But you're pretty optimistic at 22 years old. Now yeah. that I'm 47, 25 years later, I've experienced different kinds of physical pain, uh, relational pain, yeah. emotional pain, uh, loss. And so I find myself sometimes literally just hearing a song on grace and I'll just get a tear in my eye and I'll just think about God's grace in a way I didn't. Now I'm 47. So I anticipate going forward. I'm thinking, wow, there's going to be more physical pain. There's probably going to be more tragedy probably. And I hope God's grace will become richer and richer and deeper for me over those next few years. That's my guess. And that's my hope. How has your journey shifted from when you wrote this 25 years ago about grace to now? How has it become more real and deep and changed in your own personal life? Hmm. I tell a lot of that story in the memoir that I mentioned, Where the Light Fell, hmm. because uh, I lived in a, a small family, just three of us. My father died when I was a year old, so I never knew him. So my mother was a widow and then two sons, an older brother and me. And OK, small family, three people, two of those people, my mother and brother had not spoken for more than 50 years, had not seen each other. He moved to California, no communication for 50 years. Mm. And then as I was working on the memoir, and when I turned it in, after I turned it in, I actually got them on the telephone together four different times. And it, they were real pleasant conversations. There was no happy reconciliation, but I got them talking at least. And shortly before my mother died, she was 99. I turned 99 just a week before she died. Uh, my brother sent her a card that had just three words, I forgive you. Wow. And I, it took me a lot of energy oh just emotional energy my brother was very wounded he was easily scared away he, he had a hard time with relationships and i i've learned grace in just being aware of what a damaged person he was and i think mm. I, I use this phrase in the book called grace healed eyes yeah. because because jesus i mean jesus wasn't encouraging immoral behavior when he hung around prostitutes and, you know, they were attracted to him. And that's what puzzles me. What, how did Jesus 
being a perfect person, why wasn't he a threat to them? Why, why wasn't he the kind of person they would just feel, I want to get away from him, it just makes me uncomfortable? No, they flocked to Jesus. And it was the, it was the church people who made them feel uncomfortable. And I, I keep thinking, why did I write that book? Well, because in, in church, that's not the first place people think of going when they're deeply hurting. They don't think, oh, I'll go to church, it'll make me feel better. Usually they say to me, I, I never go to church, they're going to make me feel worse. I'm already feeling bad, you know, my, my life is a mess. And, and church is for people who have it together. No, <laughs> church is for people who know they don't have it together. There are a lot of more interesting ways to spend Sunday morning if you have it together. But church is for people who say, I, I need this, you know, I need the Eucharist, I need the community, I need the prayer, I need the worship, I need God. And church is the place where we keep that flame alive. We keep that message alive that Jesus mm. gave to us. And, and that's why I keep harping that tune of grace because uh, John described Jesus as coming full of grace and truth. What a, what a great phrase, full of grace, full of truth. And the church has real, really worked hard on that truth angle. You know, there have been councils and creeds and denominations and all this stuff. I want to, I want some churches to compete on the grace deal. We, we are the most gracious church, grace-filled church. And, and we're going to risk our reputations by reaching out to people who other churches don't want in their congregation. We want them. Mm -hmm. There was a church here in, in Denver, near where I live, with the title, this is the name of the church, Scum of the Earth. <laughs> <laughs> Scum of the Earth Church. And I, I like that title. I went there a couple times. <laughs> Uh, you know, you, we're, that's who we are. It's on common okay. ground before the cross. <laughs> that is an interesting marketing strategy. Right. Yes. Piece of it, but that's, that's fascinating. So there's, there's kind of two flip sides to grace. One is huh. the opposite legalism, which yeah. you've talked about, which is essentially when we take something secondary, make it primary, and we just die on the wrong hill. And I yes. do love that you have a section in your book that says legalism just leads to apostasy. And I mm -hmm. see this all the time, Philip. On my channel, I have a lot of ex-Christians on and atheists and agnostics. Just had a buddy on a few weeks ago. And one thing that consistently pops up is just either people saying to know God, you have to have certainty mm -hmm. or just legalism and a lack of grace and relationships. Uh. The flip side to that is what we might call libertinism that says, all right, we're saved by God's grace. So yeah. why follow the law? And of course, Paul yep. deals with this in Romans yes. chapter six, but you kind of ask the question in the book, and I'd love you to flesh this out. If people know God will have grace for them, why not sin and ask for forgiveness later? <laughs> right. Well, when somebody asks me that question, I'll say, uh, why don't you go home? and read Galatians and 1 Corinthians back to back. <laughs> because Galatians was written for the legalists. And uh, Paul, mm. it, you'll never find Paul more angry, just furious, actually using bad language in there. You know, I can't believe you foolish Galatians, go back, go back, don't do this. And then 1 Corinthians, he's, he's not quite as angry, but pretty angry because they, they're they spoiling the communion service and there's a rumor of, of uh, some sort of family incest going on and, you know, they're drinking too much and eating too much instead of worshiping God. It's just one thing after another. So you got these two things where these people, they're very uh, they're Judaic, so they want you to follow all the laws of the Old Testament. And these people, they don't want you to follow any laws. They just want to have a good time. You know? <laughs> and Paul has a word for both, a strong word for both. But the passage in, in Romans that you mentioned uh, I, as I recall, three different times in those chapters when Paul kind of feels caught in a corner. Well, if grace is that great, why can't we just take advantage of it, exploit it, and, and get forgiven later? And you know what he says? The, the only thing he can come up with was, God forbid. <laughs> <laughs> and he says that three different times, God forbid. But he, 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 he doesn't really say, well, the reason that doesn't work is because, no, I mean, he's kind of, he has painted himself into a corner and, and that's that unfairness of grace. Now we're not God, we're not making those judgments, but Paul looks at what God has offered and said, ah, only God can figure this out. You know, 
I, I really think Paul doesn't have an argument that, that solves that dilemma. It's, it's, a, it's a true dilemma that you bring up. And he just says, God forbid. Uh, if, if, if that's what you're after, you just don't even, you don't even want grace. You don't even understand what it's all about. Mm-hmm. And I use the I- illustration in my book of uh, a person who's about to get married and he says, honey, I love you, but you know, I do have this problem. I like other women too. So let's get this straight. Exactly what can I get away with? Uh, is kissing okay? Like uh, hugging, uh, what, do we have to have our clothes on? You think, why is this guy getting married? <laughs> Who would marry this guy? <laughs> no, he doesn't understand what love is. He doesn't understand what marriage is. And if somebody has that approach to what can I get away with with God, then they don't understand what God's what, what God wants from us. They don't understand what loving God, serving God is all about. Hmm. God forbid. <laughs> Two last questions for you. Some of the hardest questions I get today, emailed and in person, are how to balance grace and truth. A lot of these are around issues of sexuality and what that looks like to be loving towards somebody but maybe, you know, not embrace or endorse certain beliefs or certain behavior. One of the things I came up with is I wrote a blog and I just said the tension of grace and truth. If you're not living in the tension of this, then you're probably erring on one side or the other. So if you don't feel tension for truth, you might be giving too much grace. If you don't feel tension of grace, you might be preaching like a prophet, you know, and not giving enough grace. You understand the balance if you're preaching too much truth. So... I'm curious, how would you say that Christians can uphold good moral values in our secular society? And especially because earlier in the discussion, you said something like, I like the Ten Commandments. They help us flourish. Mm -hmm. So I'm not talking about arguing for a theocratic state, but certain good moral values in society help us better flourish. Right. So how can Christians uphold good moral values in a secular society while balancing grace and truth? Yeah. Yeah, it's a very good question. I, a couple things I would say. First, be careful when you apply your values to people who don't start where you start. Because we start with the foundation that God has God has truth. And God has that foundation of moral values. So we believe these things are important because God told us they are important. Other cultures don't necessarily do that. And and we have the advantage of living in a, in a culture that has a historic Christian foundation. So, you know, it kind of permeates our society in ways that aren't, aren't true in other parts of the world. But as soon as you start kind of taking your values and, and constructing your legal system based on something from your religion, it gets a little tricky because we live in a pluralistic society. There are Hindus here, there are Buddhists here, and there are atheists here. And, and to, you know, like in, in Calvin, John Calvin's Geneva, it was against the law not to go to church. <laughs> you know? Gosh. Well, you know, no, <laughs> that, that's not America. Uh, we, t- we separated church and state and, and the church has flourished in, in that separation. And what we're called to do is be countercultural, countercultural. Mm-hmm. We're called to be different in our society. And just kind of an easy, an easy uh, way to distinguish those, Sean. If you look at the Ten Commandments, I remember there was this judge in Alabama who had a statue of the Ten Commandments and he was getting in problems because you're not supposed to have something like that on government property, you know, and I think they made him remove it. And I thought, now that's it, really interesting because best I can figure, only two of the Ten Commandments are, are involve illegality in the United States. Thou shalt not covet. It's not against the law to covet. Thou shalt not commit adultery. It's not against the law to commit adultery. Mm-hmm. Thou shalt not, uh, you know, have, have greed and, and just just go down the list. Uh, murder and yep. and uh, uh, theft I, right. are the only two that I know are illegal. The other ones are, you know, honoring God, honoring your parents. There's no law against that. So so it's kind of funny when you when we think, well, yeah. Every society would work better if the if they all followed the Ten Commandments. But as soon as you write them into the legal code, yeah, it gets a little tricky here. And uh, so separating out what should be immoral compared to illegal, that's an important thing. And then, to, and then to realize the world is going to do some things that we strongly disapprove of. In fact, Paul is very clear about that. 
I think it was another case of, of incest in First uh, Corinthians that he had heard about. And then he mm-hmm. said, he said, uh, but what does that have to do with us? You know, he, he's not part of the church, you know, so we're not responsible for judging people's behavior outside of the church. If that were happening in the church, we would be. But Christians get the reputation of kind of meddling. And a lot of people think Christians are trying to keep them from doing things they want to do. And mm-hmm. um, in some cases, yes, but not necessarily because of the Ten Commandments, but because we really believe they're destructive to the person and to society. Mm-hmm. So those are tricky issues, but uh, we, we need to remember in the United States, we've got this great tradition of the people who truly believe something is important to their faith, they can go all the way to the Supreme Court and they usually win. The Supreme Court acknowledges people of faith traditions have different rules that apply to them compared to the rest of society. Hmm. So last question. Earlier, you mentioned that when you ask people what they think of evangelical Christians, more often than not, it's intolerant, too political, uh, not words like gracious, kind, and loving. About Mm -hmm. 10 years ago, I was at the Evangelical Theological Society, and Daryl Bach, a New Testament professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, said, when people hear that narrative, what will best change their minds is when their next thought is, but I know an evangelical Christian and they're not that way. Relationship. And I've always remembered that and asked myself, who am I in relationship with that sees the world differently? My last question is, what are some practical things we as Christians can do to be agents of grace today? Mm-hmm. I would say two things come to mind. One is just what you mentioned: hang around people who are different than you. You don't learn how to you don't learn how to be a grace person by hanging around people who are just like you. <laughs> that that doesn't take any grace. What takes grace is when you're around somebody who challenges you intellectually, maybe, or or is morally offensive to you. Uh, there is a great statement by Lee Beach who wrote a book called Church in Exile. And he said, to really grow in grace, uh, you need to be, maybe go to a few less Bible studies and go to a few more places where you're around people who have no idea what grace is. And, and you can learn just by that diversity. So seek out that kind of diversity, mm. whether it's racial or uh, religious, or I, I'm in a book group, for example, and the only thing we have in common is that we all have a degree from the University of Chicago. I'm the only one who's involved in any kind of church situation. And it's, it's great to be with these people. They're, they're fine, good citizens, family people, but they, we read the same books and they see it so differently than I do. And it's important for me to know how they are reading those very books that I'm reading. And I, I learn how they think and how I can write to them in a way that would make sense. So that's one thing, just hang around people who are not like you, politically and in every other way. And then the second thing is just that act of service. Um, mm. the, the way to grace is, is always bending down. When, when Jesus spent his last night with his disciples, he gave them that image of foot washing. Oh, you're, the, you're the top guy, what are you doing washing our feet? Well, that, that's the motion of grace. It's always one that's bending down. And it may be uh, being a foster parent, it may be being uh, visiting prisoners, you know, people may be taking a mission trip, but service is how you learn to be like Jesus. I've got a ton more questions for you, and I know you'd have grace for me, but at some point I would wear out my welcome. So we got to wrap this up, but I do want to encourage you to let you know a, a significant chunk of what I do in this channel, it's shaped by apologetics is I really wanna treat people with charity and with kindness who see the world differently and be an agent of grace. I know I fall short, but a lot of your writings, including your book that I love as well, Vanishing Grace, has left a significant imprint on me. So I know you get a lot of hate mail. In fact, there's some stories in this book they are gonna stir some folks up. There's a few points I read. I'm like, I don't know if I'm with Philip on this one. You know, we could have <laughs> had that debate. That's for another time, but okay. love your book want to encourage all my viewers to pick up, even the old one is great, but pick up the new one, What's So Amazing About Grace by Philip Yancey. Read it, talk about it, study it, work it into your life. Uh, it's just, it's so well done. 
And before you go away, make sure you hit subscribe. We've got a lot of other conversations coming up on some really interesting topics of archaeology. We're going to do near-death experiences again. We've got a story of somebody who left Buddhism who came to Christ. You're not going to want to miss it. Make sure you hit subscribe. If you've ever thought about studying apologetics, we would love to have you in our Biola program. And it is important to us in our program to speak truth, but do it graciously. There's information below. It's all a distance program. And if you thought, I don't know, I'm ready for a master's. We have a certificate program. We love to walk through with you how to defend your faith. And there is a very significant discount below. Get started today. Phil, thanks again for your time. Thanks for writing a great book. And uh, we'll do it again. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Sean.